Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. You're listening to the Thai Expat Daily Show. I'm your host, Kieran Mack, and thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to like this video if you're watching us on YouTube, and please do subscribe. We are also available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and a host of other podcast players. Now that that's all done, let's jump into today's show. Well, hello there. We are back and today is Sunday, the 13th of February 2022. That's Valentine's Eve for all you love bugs out there. And we'll jump into those daily nationwide COVID numbers as we always do each and every day. The country registered 25 more COVID-19 fatalities and 16,330 new cases during the previous 24 hours, the Public Health Ministry announced early Saturday morning. This compared with the 23 coronavirus-related fatalities and 15,242 new cases they reported the day before. There were 16,100 local cases and 150 imported ones. On Friday, 9,205 COVID-19 patients were discharged from hospital after recovering from the coronavirus. Now, as we said, 16,330 confirmed new cases with about 8,354 probable cases. So we're looking at numbers somewhere around 25,000, 150 cases from abroad and 131 from prisons. Out of the 118,493 patients, 56,099 are in hospital. There were 25 deaths, 610 people are now in ICU, with 128 on ventilators. Chambury Public Health Office is reporting 813 confirmed cases, 521 probable cases and no deaths. Most confirmed cases were in Chambury with 223, Sivar with 203 and 131 in Bang Lamung, Patia area. There are 6,168 patients now in care there. And Phuket Health Office reported 587 new cases on the island, out of which 478 are local and 109 are from abroad. There were no new deaths and there are now 5,151 people in care. Now, as you can see, the numbers have started to rise daily over the last four to five days. I will not be using words such as surging, ravaging, which is what the local media here in Thailand seem to be calling it. They're increasing. I think it's been expected. Most of us would have expected it at this stage. But uh, Thailand's COVID-19 zoning has remained unchanged from the CCSA meeting that they had on Friday, despite this uh, increase in infections. The Center for COVID-19 Situation Administration has decided to maintain the current zoning of COVID-19 areas, even though daily infections are on the rise, especially in sandbox provinces, according to the CCSA spokesman, Dr. Tuisan. He told a press conference that 5,435 COVID-19 infections were reported today in the eight sandbox provinces and 3,792 cases in the 18 other areas, altogether accounting for about half of the infections nationwide. He urged people in those 26 provinces to help health officials to reduce the infection rate so the economy can move forward without further disruption. The current zoning of COVID-19 areas is as follows, 44 orange or controlled areas, 25 yellow or high surveillance areas and 8 sandbox areas. On Thursday, Dr. Chakarat attributed the jump in infections in 23 provinces to the relaxation of lockdown measures and increased social gatherings, as he urged travellers to those provinces to be extra careful, especially people affected by underlying conditions. He pointed out that last week, infections among children and teenagers were on the rise, mostly infected by family members at schools or by other people in their communities. Now, regarding the incidence of vaccination side effects, the Public Health Ministry's database up until February 6 shows that more than 117 million doses of vaccine have been administered here in Thailand, and most of the incidents of severe side effects have been related to the Sinovac vaccine. The incidence of heart muscle or heart issue inflammation were mostly related to the Pfizer vaccine, while blood clots or low blood cell counts were mostly related to the AstraZeneca vaccine. The death rate among children with COVID-19 is just 2 in 10,000 infected, but that would be much lower if the children have been vaccinated. So overall, the big discussion last week was were there going to be increased restrictions here in Thailand, what was going to happen, and nothing has really increased. There's no new rules, regulations here in the country. It's pretty much the status quo as we are now continuing forward. 
No real talk either in relation to the test and go program being, you know, reduced down to maybe one COVID test on arrival or anything like that. Still maintaining this current test and go, which we'll go into the numbers later on in the show because really this new system that they brought in is just not attracting people. And moving along to the first story of the day, tourism fee postponement likely. The collection of a tourism fee from foreign visitors will be delayed by at least two months from the scheduled date of April 1st as payment methods have not been concluded. Tourism operators have bemoaned the collection of the 300 baht fee as untimely given the industry's weak recovery from the pandemic. Tourism and Sports Minister said the National Tourism Policy Committee meeting on Monday supported a tourism fund being set up from the collection fees. The next step in the process is to propose the policy to the Cabinet. On receiving approval, the details of the fee collection must be announced in the Royal Gazette within 90 days. However, implementation is likely to be delayed beyond April as airlines, which are probably going to be responsible for collecting the charge, ask for at least three months to prepare. The Ministry must still finalise collection methods for those entering the country overland. The Fund Committee is going to be chaired by the Permanent Tourism Secretary and include representatives from the Budget Bureau Office of the National Economic and Social Development Council, the private sector and other related state agencies. Of the 300 baht fee, about 20% has been allotted for insurance coverage for international tourists, with the majority, 50%, directed to tourism product development in Thailand. Tourism Authority of Thailand Governor Yutasak Supasorn said the country's tourism supply, both in terms of products and services, still needs an enormous amount of development to increase value, particularly from local products and festivals that can generate income more equally. The TAT and two state agencies, the Creative Economy Agency and the Thailand Convention and Exhibition Bureau, signed a Memorandum of Understanding on Thursday to support the creative industry via festivals and tourism areas that have the potential to be promoted in relation to soft power as part of the local creative economy. He said the cooperation should increase tourism revenue by 20% through nine categories, food, film, fashion, festivals, fights, museum, music, masters, and the metaverse. So there you have it. The fee probably is going to be coming into effect. They're looking now somewhere probably around June or July. Again, a lot of pushback from many, many people. It's meant to be a tourism fee. So they've yet to figure out or announce how a Thai person who's returning home or leaving because they're not tourists would be exempt from doing it. How would they get this money back that they would be paying if they could get the money back? If it's going to be a tourism fee, then why would long-term expats in the country have to pay it as well? Will there be a mechanism for them to get this money back? You know, if you're, if you're, for example, a businessman who lives in Thailand and you travel to various parts of Southeast Asia, because people do, you know, weekly, that kind of money adds up over the course of the year. So I think kind of exemptions should exist. If they're going to bring in a tourism fee, then exemptions should exist for, you know, type citizens living in the country who travel outside and long-term expats who live here who have non-immigrant visas, etc. But we'll see where it goes and we'll let you know when it comes into effect and how that will affect the actual price of your ticket. And next up, Anti-Amnesty International Drive picks up. An aide to Prime Minister Prayat chan cha said he is preparing to submit a petition next week seeking the expulsion from the country of human rights group Amnesty International, which ultra-royalists accuse of undermining national security. Sek Sakal Atawang, a vice minister in the office of the Prime Minister, said the petition opposing Amnesty's presence in Thailand had garnered 1.2 million signatures. The petition will be submitted to the National Security Council Interior Ministry within a week. Ultra-royalists have accused the London-based group of stoking unrest by calling for a halt of the filing of criminal charges against people who urge reform of the monarchy. This organisation destroys the security of the country. It supports groups that want to topple the monarchy. It lacks impartiality and sided with an anti-government movement that is anti-constitutional monarchy, Mr. Sexakal, a former red-shirt rabble-rouser known as Rambo Isan, told Reuters. Jano Priot in November ordered an investigation into Amnesty. He has not commented publicly on the petition. The drive to expel Amnesty gained traction after it made comments in support of three protest leaders whose actions were deemed by the Constitutional Court as an attempt to overthrow the monarchy. Amnesty, in a statement on Friday, urged the government to honour its human rights obligations. 
while we recognise that the Royal Thai Government has a duty to protect public order and national security, we continue to highlight that authorities must do so in a manner that is in accordance with international human rights law, it said. Youth-led protests against the Pride government gathered pace late in 2020 and included unprecedented calls for royal reform that triggered a crackdown by authorities. More than 1,700 activists now face security-related charges, including at least 169 charged under the Les Majest law that punishes perceived royal insult by up to 15 years in jail. The move against amnesty comes as the government also seeks to pass a law regulating non-profit organisations. More than 1,000 local and international groups have opposed it, saying it threatens to gut civil society. A controversial draft law regulating non-profit organisations could muzzle freedom of expression, experts say. The bill has broadly defined the organisation subject to its regulation as non-profit, which covers not only non-governmental organisations, that's NGOs, but other groups of people formed to exercise their freedom of expression, noted the Secretary General of the Foundation for Consumers. Organisations covered by the bill would be required by law to disclose mission statements and their sources of funding. They would be prohibited from engaging in activities vaguely defined as detrimental to national security or social harmony. And moving along to the featured story of today, hopes pinned on India travel bubble. Thailand will soon initiate a travel bubble with India with the main goal of attracting high-value young Indian visitors who can make a significant contribution to the recovery of the kingdom's tourism-dependent economy. The Centre for COVID-19 Situation Administration on Friday approved a proposal on the Thai Indian Air Travel Bubble, that's the ATB, in which extra convenience will be offered to air passengers travelling between the two countries, despite some remaining COVID-19 restrictions, said the CCSA spokesman. Airlines and air ticket agents, together with COVID-19 control authorities, will play a key role in this bilateral tourism promotion campaign, he said. About 1.9 million Indian tourists came to Thailand in 2019, a 25% increase from the previous year, said the spokesman, citing figures from the Ministry of Tourism and Sports. They each spent seven days and 44,700 baht in Thailand on average, he said. In 2019, this generated about 80 billion baht for Thailand's tourism income, a 20% rise from the previous year when India had already become Thailand's third largest tourism market, with over 300 flights running from India to Thailand, the spokesman said. Indian visitors represent Thailand's hope for the recovery of tourism, said the vice president of both the Tourism Council of Thailand and the Indian Thai Chamber of Commerce. India is a high-value tourism market, given it has 600 to 700 million people aged 29 years and under. She said, the country also has a growing number of new millionaires. The Ministry of Tourism and Sports previously forecast 20% growth in the numbers of Indian visitors to Thailand by 2030, while the World Bank projected that 83 million Indian tourists will be travelling overseas by the same year, up from 24 million in 2017, Miss Sam Song said. Thailand's main rivals for Indian tourists are Dubai and Singapore, she said. Holiday makers account for 85% of visitors from India. They are mostly aged 25 to 35 years of age and like to travel with groups of friends, family or as a couple, she noted. Spokesman Tanakorn Wang Bunkanchana said earlier the government hoped to start talks with China and Malaysia this month in a bid to secure more travel bubbles. The COVID-19 test and go scheme for foreign tourists restarted on February 1st. So it's unclear what exactly they mean by travel bubbles because surely the test and go program that they have now is what they will be offering them. I can't see them getting any special privileges in relation to arriving in the country and not having to do certain COVID tests and whatnot. The Thai government have become very strict upon that and it does make you wonder what exactly they're talking about. I think the idea of the travel bubble with India is just so they can start to allow flights from India to Thailand directly because right now if you're an Indian citizen you want to come to Thailand you have to fly to like Abu Dhabi or Dubai and then fly to Thailand there is no direct flights still and that's because of the Indian government have basically banned flights leaving and I think they've extended that ban to the end of February so this won't be starting certainly this month. It's interesting that every travel bubble seems to focus on 
these are the people that are going to save the Thai economy for some reason. Uh, it was China last week, it was Malaysia, now it's India. I, I just wonder, perhaps they take what they have, which is the test and go program, reduce it down to its skeleton, its minimum, and see does that start to attract more people. Now, to look at the international arrivals since the quarantine free, and I say that very loosely, since November, right? So the total arrivals. In November, we had 133,061 arrivals. In December, we had 290,617. In January, 189,193. And that's despite the suspension of the test and go on the 22nd of December. Now, from the 1st to the 10th of February, which is when the new test and go came in, okay? We've had a total of 55,823 arrivals. Now that works out an average at about 5,500 travelers each day arriving into Thailand. It's not many at all. And I would solely put this down to the entry requirements, the Thailand Pass, the COVID test on arrival and the COVID test on day five. And actually the pre-departure, in my opinion, also is, is a game changer in that it forces people now to have nearly three COVID tests before they get to enjoy their holiday, really, you know, if you think about it. And so, yes, you can see that this test and go program is not working in any shape or form. Five and a half thousand arrivals each day. I mean, that's nothing when you consider you're th- talking about the arrival of Bangkok, Phuket, so yeah, it's very, very little. And actually out of that, the test and go was only 23,000. There was 27,000 sandbox and then uh, the AQ, the quarantine is just over 5,000. So yeah, very few people coming into the country. I'm not sure if we're going to see a real huge increase over the next few months. Those kind of things are still up in the air because of the restrictions to get here and the concept of what they think travelers are willing to undergo and as we can see from this people are not willing to spend hard-earned money to come to Thailand to be subjected to this kind of rigorous PCR testing. Now a very interesting fact that's come out over the last couple of days is in relation to Russians traveling to Thailand. Now since the 1st to the 10th of February we have had about 4,103 people fly from Russia to Thailand and out of that 4,103 768 of them have tested positive which is about 18 and a half percent now that to me is shockingly high for a single country of people the average for most countries is around three and a half percent last month the total average was 3.73 percent so there is a significantly high set of people coming from Russia that are testing very high and actually next on that list is Kazakhstan right, which is 7%. So you have a huge amount of people from Russia, a former Russian uh, country, whatever you want to call it, that are testing very, very high. And what are the reasons for that? Now, some research into this whole topic about uh, fake PCR tests and fake vaccine certificates is, I think, where the problem lies. Firstly, in Russia, it's apparently quite easy to get yourself a fake vaccine certificate. And this fake vaccine certificate is a real fake in that you have not had any shots, but you are in that government database to say you've had your shots. Now that's what's scary. So people are coming over with that certificate, legitimate certificate, I guess, if you think it's fake, but really, if you scan it, it's legitimate. It comes from their database to say that you are fully inoculated. That to me is a huge problem. And I also have read there are a lot of fake PCR test certificates available in Russia. And this is the kind of thing the Thai government are up against. And obviously they don't care because they're freely letting in Russians at this stage. And you can see that 18% or so of Russian arrivals testing positive. I find the number very interesting. We look at the likes of, you know, the USA, 1%. Australia, 1%. UK, 1.5%. So yeah, it is significantly high. And if they're going to have a test and go program that, that they say is here to protect Thailand, you know, from COVID, then why... When you see such a high group of people who obviously there's a problem behind all their testing and their vaccine certificates, you continue to allow in. It's only about money. This is all about money. If there was no system that they have right now where people are being locked up for 10 days and having to pay this, that and the other and pay for all these PCR tests, they probably would have blocked them a long time ago coming. But because there's big money to be made when you get to Thailand for people who test positive for COVID, it's allowed to continue with no investigation into the whole matter. But guys, I'd love to know what you think. Do you think this kind of high number of Russian COVID positive cases is from fake vaccine certificates or even fake PCR tests? I mean, what what would you account it for? Or just a bad vaccine? I'm not sure. I'd love to know, guys, your opinion about all this as usual down below in that comment section. And speeding along, TAT launches drive to restore tourism. 
The Tourism Authority of Thailand is implementing its Visit Thailand Year 2022 Amazing New Chapters campaign to help revive the country's tourism sector while playing a positive role in the overall economy. Tat Governor Yutasak Supasorn said the campaign will focus on Thailand's soft power assets which include food, film, fashion festivals, traditions, music, museums and technology. To achieve this, TAT has formulated a DASH model to maneuver the entire organization towards the single goal of transforming the tourism sector, Mr. Yutasak said. D stands for domestic travel, which TAT will emphasize to both tourists and tourism operators, he said. A is for accelerate demand to stimulate qualitative demand by targeting high income segments, delivering valuable experiences while focusing on safety. S stands for shape supply to elevate tourism ecosystems through quality and sustainability. This will be based on responsible tourism and digital tourism resulting in sustainable income distribution, he said. And finally, H is for healing the Thai economy, which puts a focus on strong and sustainable growth in the tourism sector as their country reopens. With the DASH model, TAT is placing greater emphasis on domestic tourism, Mr. Yutasak said. For international tourism, TAT is introducing its Amazing Thailand Workplace Paradise project, which aims to make Thailand the world's top destination for remote workers, he said. The project is in response to the high growth of remote work due to the pandemic. TAT expects Thailand's tourism industry to generate 1.28 trillion baht and attract up to 10 million international arrivals this year. Some 656 billion baht is expected to come from the domestic market and 625 billion baht from the international market. Domestic tourists spend an estimated 4,100 baht per person compared to 62,580 baht per person on average for foreign tourists. And blasting off into another universe, Padka Prao goes into the atmosphere. If you think enjoying Padka Prao in restaurants or on the street may be a bit ordinary, how about sending it off into space? Or almost. The Geoinformatics and Space Technology Department Agency and related authorities have launched an experiment in Nakhon Sawan province in which they send Padka Prao to the atmosphere using high altitude balloons to find out whether the altitude had any effect on the ingredients. The experiment will be used as a model for future scientific research, particularly into space. It can also be used as a model for other experiments at altitudes of 30 to 100 kilometers above the Earth's surface. GISTDA claims that the experiment is the next step in developing space technology in Thailand, in which the use of high altitude balloons will help in creating a research base or even a rocket launch base for the country and most importantly will promote knowledge sharing in space science. After the landing it was found that one of the two Caprao dishes went missing. And finally the Phuket News Data Report. Phuket edition of Monopoly to launch next month. The Phuket edition of Monopoly will be officially launched next month at an event held at Central Floresta Shopping Mall. PR department denounces involvement in loan shark lure. The Phuket office of the public relations department confirmed the existence of a fake PR department page on Facebook used by scammers to lure people into taking loans. The real PR Phuket office assured it has nothing to do with the page and warned people not to trust this ad luring people to take out informal loans. Volunteers to tackle sewage litter in Phuket Town Canal. A joint campaign by Royal Thai Volunteers and the Rak Banyai Club will aim to clear weeds, litter and other debris from the Banyai Canal which runs through the heart of Phuket town so that the foul smells emanating from sewage in the canal will dissipate. And finally, new fire station officially opens in Surakul. A new fire station in Surakul Stadium officially opened yesterday amid much fanfare and a monk's blessing ceremony. But ultimately, with this story or anything else that stood out to you today, I'd love to know your thoughts in the comments down below. Because yes, this is a new show, but it's also a conversation. Now keep that conversation going. Make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, share the video, and do all the good stuff that does help that YouTube algorithm. But ultimately, my name is Kieran Mack. You've been listening to the Thai Expat Daily Show, and we will see you next time.